Hello, I'm Terrence F. Anderson, and this is Health Watch. So, have you ever heard of the Institute for Public Health Innovation? How about health disparities and health inequities? Terrence that I've used more than once on Health Watch. Well, on this edition, we're going to learn about all three of these topics, and we'll even include what are defined as the social determinants of health. And my guest today is a genuine expert on all things public health. His name is Dr. Michael Worcester, Vice President of the Institute for Public Health Innovation. Dr. Worcester is the President of the Virginia Public Health Association and a former Director of the Virginia Department of Health, Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. He also formerly served as the Director of the Crater Health District, which is based in Petersburg and includes five counties as well as two cities in Southside Virginia. Dr. Worcester is a board certified physician in general preventive medicine and public health and received his clinical training in family medicine. He also completed a fellowship in community-based participatory research. He is certainly well placed to expound upon our topics today and I'm very pleased and delighted to welcome him to Health Watch. Welcome to Health Watch, sir. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to see you. We always have some very good, interesting conversation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And, and public uh, health, uh, health disparities are something I'm particularly interested in. I, I've talked about it a few times. Uh, and we have a great deal of information that we're going to share with our viewers today. We're going to put a host of uh, boards up with, uh, with a lot of data and just some generally good information. Uh, so we don't necessarily have to refer to these things, but uh, uh, they are a lot. So let's just get started. That work? That sounds good. Okay. Let's begin with the mission of the Institute for Public Health uh, Innovation. Mm -hmm. What is the mission? And if you can just give us a general overview. Sure. Well, the Institute for Public Health Innovation is one of 38 public health institutes around the country um, that serve different geographic areas. We serve Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. Um, I'm based in Richmond, Virginia, and work across the state. Um, our mission is really around um, working with local communities um, to identify and address uh, complicated and important health issues uh, mm -hmm. to promote health for all residents with a particular focus on those who experience health disparities or inequities. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do <coughs> is around developing, um, implementing, and evaluating innovative public health strategies with partners in local communities. Um, we do a lot of work around providing training, technical assistance, and capacity building for our partners. Uh, we also do work around policy um, development and policy advocacy uh, in order to create and promote policies that promote health. And then finally, we also serve as a convener of local partners um, who are interested in addressing critical health issues, and we help mm -hmm. them to do that. So these are essentially kind of like the core functions of the Institute for Public Health Innovation? Correct. Those, those four things that I mentioned are our core functions in, in helping us to achieve that mission of promoting health for all. Uh, weren't there uh, a certain set of factors that contributed to the Institute for Public Health Innovation coming into existence? I mean, you spoke of several different uh, things that you're addressing, but there mm -hmm. must have been some, some need, some compelling need. Yeah, well, um, typically institutes come into existence to help support the existing um, organizations and communities that are promoting public health. We're a nonprofit organization mm -hmm. that's really committed to supporting and strengthening the infrastructure in communities that promote health. And so a lot of our work is around not only developing strategies as a, as a leader, but also playing a support role to help organizations that are doing great work uh, to be more effective. And so through kind of discussions with folks throughout our region, we identified that there seemed to be a need for a public health institute. And in 2009, um, the institute was born. Um, out of a national nonprofit organization called Common Health Action. And since okay. then, we've grown to an organization of about $4 million and about 30, 35 staff um, throughout the region uh, in a, involved in a range of strategies and policy issues to promote um, health. That's some substantial growth. Um, let's talk uh, more specifically about health disparities and, and health inequities. One would think that those terms are synonymous, but they're not necessarily, are they? Not necessarily. Um, I think traditionally the term health disparity has been used more generally to describe differences in health status among different groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, so an example could be uh, that with data shows that um, white women have a higher rate of breast cancer diagnosis than women of color, mm -hmm. um, or that sickle cell anemia is more common among African Americans. These are um, health data with differences across groups, but they really don't de de define those differences in any more detail. Whereas health inequities 
are disparities that are considered to be more pr predictable and patterned across groups. Mm -hmm. um, they're ultimately uh, avoidable, and as a result, they're considered to be unfair or unjust. And so examples would be, uh, whereas we see a higher rate of breast cancer diagnosis among white women, we actually see a higher rate of breast cancer death among African American women, which is very strongly related to um, decreased access to health care, yes, yes. um, not necessarily receiving the same level of care depending on the stage of disease, et cetera. Another example um, might be the, um, in, in terms of sickle cell, um, studies show that African Americans are less likely to re receive sufficient pain medicine based on the level of pain they have. And so that could be considered an inequity in terms of that tr pain treatment. Another example, which is, I think, more um, seen throughout our communities today around obesity, is that uh, the reality is that obesity is more common in communities where there's less access to healthy foods yes. or fewer yes. places to be physically active or people feel unsafe being physically active. And so those factors contribute to the increased risk um, of obesity among low-income and racial and ethnic minority communities. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, they, they have this uh, BERFIS, we call it BERFIS, Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, mm -hmm. uh, which is essentially a survey, a, a, a randomized telephone survey, and, and that plays some role in, in, in how you guys access the needs in the community. Can you elaborate on that for us? Sure, yeah. Um, well, Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance um, Survey um, is something that we've used, particularly when I was with the health department, mm -hmm. um, to look at health inequities and to kind of describe them in a little more detail. So one aspect of that study, that survey, that looks at a range of health behaviors and access to care, um, can also look at people's um, experiences with discrimination. Um, and there's a growing body of data that suggests that discrimination is an important risk factor for, for health. Um, outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so what that study showed was that um, when, when individuals in Virginia were asked if they've experienced discrimination in the past 30 days, about 25 percent of African Americans said they had, about 17 and a half percent of Latinos, and about five and a half percent of whites said that they had. Mm -hmm. And those who reported re um, experiencing discrimination were two to three times more likely to also report poor or fair or poor mental or physical health. Um, and that is pretty similar to national data, which suggests that experiences of discrimination are strongly related to health outcomes, whether it's health behaviors, um, increased risk of high blood pressure, or other health um, challenges. It's very interesting to note that uh, across the, the ethnic and cultural uh, spectrum that uh, some percentage of people do uh, uh, say that they have experienced some type of discrimination when it comes to health care. Yeah, well, I, I think that that would be um, what's expected, and certainly I think what we see is that it's part of it is per people's perception, um, and so based on the history and the experiences that people have, they be, may be more likely to actually experience discrimination as well as to perceive discrimination, um, and in either case, there's research that suggests that that's related to health outcomes, and so that's a, an important factor that we often don't think about in terms of health inequities. Um, but the issue around discrimination is an important one to, to consider. And, and perception is, does indeed play a role because I, I know that folks in the generation above us uh, are very acquainted with the Tuskegee experiment mm -hmm. and therefore have, have uh, some inherent uh, lack of trust when it comes to the health care system. Not necessarily um, uh, valid, mm -hmm. you know, but again, it's a factor of perception. Um, there is uh, some some data that has been collected in Virginia on uh, health inequities. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could share some of that with us and, and share who compiled this data. Sure. Well, there's a um, range of data that comes out of the Virginia Department of Health through the Division of Health Statistics. Um, when I was with the health department, we developed a um, health equity report that put a lot of that data together and analyzed some additional data to look at the extent of health inequities in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so some of the statistics that are, that are relevant are around infant mortality, where the risk um, for an infant death for African American women is two to three times higher th than that for white women. Um, All-cause mortality rates are significantly higher um, as an individual's educational attainment um, decreases. Um, Low-income Virginians are two to three times more likely to smoke. Um, physical activity is more common among um, uh, whites than, than Hispanics. And one of the, I think, most striking areas of, of inequity that we found was when we look at neighborhoods across Virginia, there's about a 26-year difference in life expectancy depending on where people live. 
those in low-income communities, those in very rural communities, and in very urban inner city communities are, have the lowest life expectancy across Virginia. And that, some of those are the areas where we see the 26-year difference in compared to the areas with the highest life expectancy. Uh, that's astounding, a 26-year difference in lifespan, expected lifespan. Yeah, and that's really dramatic. It's Indeed. not only across Virginia as a whole, but we can look within individual cities and see that same disparity. Um, I know recently we've done some data, looked at some data in Richmond and found about a 23 year difference in life expectancy just across neighborhoods within that city. So I would expect areas such as Norfolk and others would, would have a similar um, range of life expectancy. Right, right. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, and we've touched upon it, uh, I guess, in terms of uh, some of the causes mm -hmm. of uh, health disparities and, and health inequities. Um, we're defining those as the social determinants of health. Um, uh, can you elaborate on those, please? Yeah, so I think it's important to, when we think about health to have a very broad view of, of what we um, identify as being health related. Mm -hmm. um, we traditionally think of health care as being the, the critical factor in terms of health. The reality is that the United States spends more than any other country in the world on health care and our life um, outcomes are worse than any other developed Western democracy in the world. Um, we know that health behaviors are an important factor. Um, at the same time, we know that people's behaviors are, are determined by the choices that they have. And those choices often vary depending on the communities we live in. And so a lot of what we recognize now in terms of what d shapes health and what shapes health inequities is, the, is where we live, work, learn, and play. Do we have access to healthy foods in our communities? Are our communities safe for people to be physically active and to be socially um, engaged with one another? And even more importantly, are there jobs in our communities that allow people to um, be self-sustaining and to have access to the resources that um, promote health? Um, other factors include our educational system and our people receiving sufficient and adequate education that allows them to have opportunities in life that shape the neighborhoods they live in, that shape their ability to understand and, and, act, and act on health information, as well as other issues around housing. Um, and, and I think other things that we identify, particularly when we think about health inequities, is that the communities where people live are very different based on their race and ethnicity, their mm -hmm. socioeconomic status, and other factors. That low-income communities and communities of color are, are much less likely to have access to healthy foods. Um, or, or places to be physically active. And at the same time, they're more likely to um, have access, easier access to alcohol, tobacco, um, to be exposed to violence, to live in communities where there's unsafe both indoor and outdoor air quality. Um, all of this has been demonstrated in a range of studies, um, as well as having access, limited access to jobs and to oftentimes live in communities where the schools are not performing up to the standards that we would like. All of this puts um, people of low income, racial and ethnic minorities, and other groups um, in similar situations at, at a greater risk for poor health outcomes. And as a result of those differences in community environments and life opportunities, we see significant health um, inequities um, across Virginia. Uh, we're talking about a very, very complex, multi-level, uh, myriad levels uh, that impact health disparities and health equities. So uh, it, w it would uh, follow that the strategies to address them uh, would be at once very uh, comprehensive and, and intensive themselves. Uh, can you give us some ideas of, of uh, some of the strategies that you guys suggest? Yeah, well, I think there's a number of ways to look at how to address health inequities. And if we look at it both in terms of what individuals can do, in terms of what organizations can do, and what our broader society and, and um, uh, uh, decision makers can do, mm -hmm. um, can be helpful. Um, in terms of us as individuals, you know, certainly it's, in, it's incumbent upon us to um, really strive towards um, achieving our optimal health, to taking control of our health, and, and doing as much as we can to be healthy, um, whether it's around physical activity, nutrition, um, you know, avoiding unhealthy exposures around smoking and alcohol, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, when I talked about that the behaviors that we engage in are oftentimes based on the choices we have, then we as individuals also want, should work at a higher level in terms of how do we shape 
the communities we live in and how do we influence the decisions that create our communities. Mm -hmm. It's been said that um, change is really made through a small number of committed individuals working together. And so one of the roles I think that we as individuals can take is to work collaboratively um, with other folks in our communities to um, begin to talk about the, the conditions in our communities and how they affect our health and to, one, to be very active civically, um, to vote specifically around issues that um, affect our health and for officials that are committed to thinking about our health and their decisions, mm -hmm. and then holding those officials accountable for decisions that either promote or undermine our health as, as a community. Um, secondly, I think in terms of um, organizations that are, in, that are in our communities, there's many opportunities that they have to promote health equity. Um, First of all, within the programs or services that, say, um, the public health departments or medical providers or other service organizations provide, or even in, in um, private businesses, um, thinking about how we can integrate this understanding of those social determinants into our work. So if we are working on pr reducing um, obesity in our community, um, in addition to education around physical activity and nutrition, it's also critical that we are looking at are there safe places to be physically active in the communities that we're working with? And how do we engage the partners that affect those issues? Um, are we working outside of the traditional kind of medical and public health environment and thinking about the transportation decisions, the land use planning decisions, um, public safety decisions, all that influence our health? And so as an organization, how are we working with those, that broader set of partners? Um, and there's a lot of growing um, strategies around the country where, where successful work is being done in that area. Another aspect of what organizations can do is to look internally in terms of their policies and procedures, um, in terms of whether th they are promoting the health of their employees. Um, do they promote um, and have access to healthy foods? Do they encourage um, opportunities for people to be physically active? Do they provide benefits that include um, health insurance, um, a living wage, and things like that that can allow individuals and, and families mm -hmm. to be self-sufficient and to um, be healthy? And then the final group that I think is important is in terms of those broader decision makers and policy makers in our communities that ultimately shape the characteristics of where we live, work, learn, and play. Um, first, I think it's critical that they are aware of the broader context of factors that shape health outcomes. You're speaking of elected officials uh, and, and governing bodies. Yeah, exactly. And those, um, yes, that, those would be good examples, whether it's the um, city council, for example, or the mm. school board, or the city administration, um, or leaders of other um, agencies within a community, mm -hmm. um, that they are aware that all of their decisions ultimately have an impact on the health of, of communities. And in particular, if, as they think about the, um, the impact of those decisions on different populations, um, particularly those that are, we already know experience health inequities, um, that hopefully that will help them to identify policy options and strategies that first of all are health promoting um, and then secondly um, promote opportunities for everyone to be to, to achieve their optimal health and again there's a growing number of, of examples around the country where where communities are coming together to to promote that work um, if I could give maybe an example or two of I was going to ask you if you could yeah, I, sure. I work with the uh, the healthy Norfolk uh, mm -hmm. initiative uh, which is a, a team basically that consists of the types of different uh, sectors of the community that you're speaking of. Mm -hmm. um, but I was going to ask you uh, if you could give some examples of that. Yes, yeah, so I'll give some examples from some of the work that we do um, at IPHI. Um, and I mentioned in terms of bringing together a range of partners across um, different sectors to think about how the, all the policies we make influence health. Uh, so a lot of our work is working with local elected officials, local governments, um, other partners, nonprofit partners, um, around how do we work together to create healthy living environments for people. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that is focused on um, creating access to healthy foods, whether it's through um, food equity council development or um, community gardens, um, farmers markets that um, help, help lower income individuals access healthy foods. Um, we also do work around land use planning and other decision making at the community level to, to um, create opportunities uh, for, for community residents to be physically active. Um, for example, in incorporating um, physical activity elements into a local comprehensive plan 
that, that all, all jurisdictions in Virginia develop. Um, we also work with um, elected officials to think more broadly around all of the decisions that they make, whether it's land use planning or economic development or um, public safety decisions and how they all together influence health outcomes. So we're working, for example, in Richmond City right now with the um, local government, the health department, and the school board to begin to think about health in all of the decisions that they make and also to think about how these decisions affect different communities differently so that as they are making policies and passing ordinances, they're thinking about the health outcomes and uh, down the road that will create, again, environments where people live, work, learn, and play that all support their opportunities to be healthy. And, and, and it's kind of like a changing landscape as well uh, when you're dealing with uh, uh, health disparities and health equities, uh, a changing landscape that as it uh, is impacted by changing demographics in, in the state and, and throughout the nation, actually. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, we chatted earlier about the uh, increase in, in ethnic populations since 2000. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, um, I think as we've seen across the whole country, um, Virginia a as well is becoming a much more diverse um, state in terms of race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen, for example, um, a, a dramatic increase in, in diversity among the um, uh, racial and ethnic minority populations. Uh, there's been a, about a 90% increase in the Hispanic population. Um, and, and other minority populations, 45% Native American um, as, as well as Asian, and then an 11% increase among African Americans. Um, what this says, I think, when we think about health inequities is that these issues will become a greater challenge for our country as we become more diverse unless we begin to address these issues at their root, which is really around those social determinants of health. Um, racial and ethnic minority populations bring great um, value and opportunities to our communities Indeed. and at the same time it's important that we create environments that help everyone to be as healthy as they can. Um, again, I think without these changes um, in how we view health and how we address health and promote it, um, we, we really I think uh, will face greater challenges down the road as we become more diverse, um, but I think that diversity can be an opportunity for us as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see in, in the in the future in terms of uh, uh, success or uh, how we are addressing this? Because this is something, uh, health disparities and health inequities, we are something that, that uh, has been known to exist for a while, mm -hmm. um, but not formally defined. And now that there is a, uh, there is increased awareness of it and the impact uh, the different things have on health disparities and mm -hmm. equities, like uh, food deserts, people living in food deserts, like the uh, increases in ethnic populations, uh, and, and diverse, diversity in, in populations across any particular region. Uh, how, how, I don't want to say how optimistic are you, but how, how do you see these things changing? You, mm -hmm. you see that we, we can have some, some concrete changes in this direction. I'm hopeful that we will, and I think that we can. Um, I think there's been a lot of um, work that's been done within the United States as well as around the world that demonstrate that there are ways to um, promote health for everybody and to reduce inequities at the same time. And it ultimately creates greater opportunity for everybody. Um, one of the, and, and so I think part of, of that is that we really will benefit as we think about health being embedded in, in everything that we do within our society because the, the quality of our society really does shape our health. And the quality that um, everyone experiences, particularly by different groups, it um, influences whether we have health inequities or not. And so I think it's an opportunity for us to embrace the diversity um, within our, our, our state and within our country um, and to begin to or continue to um, work collaboratively across different sectors um, for individuals and, and organizations to work together to really move forward towards um, addressing health inequities and to creating opportunities for everyone. Uh, before we go, let's make sure we give some contact information for the Institute for Public Health Innovation. Sure. Um, our website is um, www.institutephi.org. Um, our DC office is the 202 number. My office in Richmond is 804-313-8880. 
um, so we can be really reached through either um, number, and our, our website has those numbers as well as my email address where I can be reached directly. Fantastic. I want to thank you so very much for joining us today. This is, we've been trying to get together to do this show for a mm -hmm. while, and I'm so glad that we finally had the opportunity to do it. Thank you so very much. Yes, definitely. I'm, I'm glad we got the chance as well, so I look forward to uh, future opportunities as well. Uh, we shall have those. And we want to thank you for joining us today for this edition of Health Watch. Of course, you can find out more information about Health Watch at our website at www.norfolk.gov forward slash health watch. If you'd like to drop me a line, you can give me a call at 757-683-8836. My email address is terrence.afford-anderson at vdh.virginia.gov. And before we take a break here, before I com let you completely go, we're going to take another look at one of the T2 and 60 Fitness Minutes, brought to you by trainer Tasha Turnbull. Take a peek. Hi, welcome to T2 and 60. My name's Tasha Turnbull. Today we're gonna to do three leg exercises to help you strengthen and tighten the legs. So the first thing we're gonna do is side leg raises. I got my chair here, so I'm just gonna lean over and I'm just gonna lick the leg up. So this can work the hips and the outer thigh. We're gonna do three sets of 20 and then you'll turn around and do it the, on, on the other leg, okay? Next exercise. We're going to lunge forward and then lunge back. Forward, back, forward, back. Again, working the front of the leg and the back of the leg. Three sets of 20 is what you can do. And then the last exercise we're gonna do are calf raises. Turn your legs out and just bring the legs up. So this is working the back of the leg, okay? Three great leg exercises for you. All right, see you soon. For the Norfolk Department of Public Health, I'm Terrence F. Anderson, and this has been Health Watch.